Roku Sponsor Talk. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's Roku logo if you've not seen it before. Uh, we're doing some stuff at a booth if you haven't come by yet. Uh, we're doing a cool thing if you go to HerokuLove.com. Uh, you can vote for your favorite open source project, and we're going to donate $500 to that project. Uh, and there's a few just Ruby trend questions. Uh, I think there's four of them in total. Uh, here's the QR code, but I don't actually expect you to scan that with your phone. Um, we're also doing a thing, uh, so Ruby Heroes is not happening uh, anymore, but uh, I did enjoy the spirit of saying thanks to people uh, in the community that have helped you with your journey uh, as a developer. And so we have these cool postcards at our booth uh, where you can write thanks and either give it to uh, the person if they're here at RailsConf, or you can just post it up on these whiteboards that we have at our booth, and then we will either tweet them or figure out a way to make that public. Um, and right after this talk, uh, there is a break. Um, there's going to be a bunch of people from the Rails core and contributor team at our booth uh, doing ops hours. So if you have questions or want to meet those folks like Aaron or Eileen or Raphael, uh, Vipul, and other people, um, you can come do that, um, get those questions answered. Uh, and I know a lot of people came by and tried to get shirts, and we ran out within like the first. 30 minutes, maybe even less. Uh, but we will have some more shirts tomorrow. So if you do stop by um, tomorrow, we hopefully will have shirts for you. Um, so with that, I'll give this to Nate to uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this is Heroku's sponsored talk. Um, I don't know if this is on. Uh, I'm on here. Um, so I do not work for Heroku. I'm not a Heroku employee. Um, but they were very nice to uh, nice enough to give me this slot. Um, this talk is called "Your App Server Config Is Wrong." When I talk about application servers, what I'm talking about are things like Puma, uh, Passenger, Unicorn, Thin, Webrick. Uh, these are all application servers. They're the things that start and run our Ruby applications. Um, but first, a little bit about uh, who the heck you're listening to right now. Um, I am a skier. I recently moved to Taos, New Mexico, um, just for the skiing, basically. Um, I uh, also am a, am a motorcycle rider. I've ridden my motorcycle cross country three times um, on dirt roads. Uh, this is my motorcycle taking a nap in the middle of nowhere, in Nebraska. Um, I was also on Shark Tank when I was 19. I was on the very first <laughs> season. That's me on Shark Tank. Um, my, one of my readers gave me this gift. I enjoy it very much. Uh, I'm also uh, a part-time meme lord. Uh, I like make spicy programming memes. I like this one. <laughs> Another spicy meme I made. <laughs> uh, you may, you probably know me though, not from any of these things, but through my blog. Uh, it looks like this. Um, I write about Ruby performance topics, um, like making Rails applications run faster. Um, uh, I also have a consultancy that I call Speed Shop, where I work on people's Ruby applications to make them um, faster, more performant, use less memory, use fewer resources. Um, I have written a book, uh, a course, about making Rails applications faster. It's at railspeed.com. It's called The Complete Guide to Rails Performance. Uh, incorrect app server configuration is probably the most common issue that I see on client applications. Uh, it's really easy to kneecap yourself um, by having an app server config uh, which isn't optimized. Um, it's easy to uh, over provision. It's easy to have uh, an app server config which makes you require more dynos, more resources um, than you actually need. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, to spend a lot of money on Heroku, uh, which is great for them, um, but it's, it's easy to scale out of your problems, right, by just cranking that little dyno slider all the way to the right, and now I don't have a performance problem anymore. Um, if you're spending more per month on Heroku than you have RPM, you probably are over-provisioned in this case. Um, it's, you don't have to spend $5,000 a month on your 1,000 RPM app. Um, I mean, maybe if you have some like really weird add-on that is like, you know, uh, something unique to you, maybe then you have to, but um, that's just kind of a rule of thumb that I've, that I've found and been able to get to that point at least on client apps, if not less than that. Uh, the other thing that can happen with a misconfigured uh, app uh, server is uh, you're not using um, your resources to the 
the, you're overusing your resources. You're using too small a dyno for the settings that um, you have uh, set. So let's talk about some definitions. Uh, container, so I, I use the words container and dyno interchangeably because that's kind of what a dyno is, right, is it's a con uh, container um, in a uh, big AWS instance or whatever, whatever they use. Um, and uh, you get some proportion of their larger um, server. So this talk, this is a Heroku talk, so I'm going to be using Heroku terminology. I'm going to say dyno, but this could also, a lot of this stuff all is not unique to Heroku. I'm just going to be discussing it in Heroku terms. Um, a worker. Uh, so in Puma, which uh, I'm now Puma, Puma maintainer um, with Richard, uh, so uh, in Puma, we uh, have workers. Uh, I don't know what they call them in Passenger um, or Unicorn, they might use a different word, but basically all of the, the top three modern um, Ruby application servers use a forking process model. So what that means is, is that uh, they start your application, uh, you know, Rails app dot initialize or whatever, and then they call fork. And they, the, your, uh, that process creates copies of itself. Those copies are what we call the workers. Uh, so uh, that's probably one of the main config settings is how many processes we're going to run per dyno. Uh, a thread, okay, well I guess we all kind of know what a thread is, um, but I just want to draw the difference here because it's very important in regular C Ruby, the difference between a process and a thread, right, is we can run as, processes run independently and so we, two processes can process two different requests at the same time, uh, but two threads cannot process um, uh, two, two requests concurrently. Um, we can do things like uh, start a request in, start creating a response in one thread, uh, and then maybe we're waiting for a database to, uh, database call to return, and we can release the global VM lock in Ruby then pick up another uh, response in a different thread, do some work there, and then go back to the original thread. So we can do some limited concurrency in Ruby. It's all usually just I.O. Um, but uh, in general, one thread, one request. Okay, so here's the overall process, and we're gonna go through each step uh, one through five. So the first thing we're gonna do is determine, uh, theoretically, how many concurrent workers, how many, how many uh, requests do we need to uh, complete concurrently? Secondly, we're going to determine uh, how many users, or sorry, how much memory each worker slash process is going to use. Then we're going to choose which container size we want to use, so which dyno size we want to use, and how many workers, how many processes we're going to put in each dyno. We're going to check uh, our connection limits, how many connections we make to the database, make sure we're not going over those limits. And then we're going to deploy and monitor uh, queue depths and queue times, um, CPU usage, memory usage, uh, how many times the, uh, our processes restart, and uh, how many times we have timeouts. Okay, so this is uh, a little hobby horse of mine. This is, Little's Law is a, a, a concept from queuing theory. Uh, it's used a lot in like factory management, um, so when they wanna know like, how many you know, packer machines they need on a floor. Um, they use things like Little's Law. Um, it's a very small equation, which is why it's very small on this slide. Uh, this is the fancy like Greek letter version. Um, if you can Google Little's Law to like get the, you know, the, the process engineering version of it, um, the, the version that we're gonna use here is just to say that the number of things, the number of things inside a system at any given time is equal to the rate at which they arrive multiplied by the time they spend in the system on average, okay? So translating that into Ruby application server terms, the number of requests that we serve at any given, are serving at any given time is on average, the number of requests we get per second times our average response time, okay? Uh, to give you a little, um, uh, sorry, yeah, and dividing the average number of requests in a system by how many workers we actually have gives us an idea of how much we're utilizing um, the workers that we have. So I'm gonna work through, if that was a little confusing, I'm gonna work through an example here um, in a second. Uh, it's important to know this is just on average. It kind of assumes that our uh, requests are arriving at equal intervals. It assumes that like 
a request will arrive every 300 milliseconds. Uh, that's not the case, of course, we know our requests arrive in bunches, they're randomly distributed. Um, so uh, this is just sort of a, a, a starting point and a guideline. Uh, so let's walk through some numbers here to give an example. Uh, I found these numbers in an old Envato presentation from 2013. Envato runs like Theme Forest, if you ever use that. Uh, it's a big Rails app. Uh, so they say that they receive 115 requests per second, which average a 147 millisecond response time, and they use 45 workers, 45 processors. I forgot which application server they use, actually. Um, so what we do is we multiply uh, the number of uh, requests per second, 115, by the average time it takes to complete run requests. So I have to, I have to keep my units the same here, right? So this is in seconds, and that is now in seconds. And that gives me 16.9. So on average, Envato is processing 17 requests at any given point in time. Uh, they use 45 workers to do that. 16.9 divided by 45, 37%. So they're using 35% of their workers at any given time. Uh, so what I tell people to do is to do this calculation for themselves. You know how many requests you get per minute. That's right on the Heroku dashboard. Um, and uh, you know your average response times. That's also on the Heroku dashboard. Multiply them together get, and multiply that again by a factor of five. So you're using 20% of your theoretical capacity. And that gives you your initial estimate of how many processes you need. Okay? Uh, five is just the fudge factor. That's taking into account the fact that your response, your uh, requests don't come in uniformly one after the other 200 milliseconds apart, or whatever your number is. Um, if that was all very confusing, I find Heroku's dyno load uh, number on their, um, on their dashboard to be fairly accurate as a starting point. Uh, so what, uh, this is at the bottom of the dashboard uh, this is like, impossible to read. Uh, so it, these numbers here on the left go from zero to eight. Uh, the dark blue line here is the uh, uh, average load over one minute, and the uh, lighter line here is the maximum load for the last minute. Um, just look at that max number, and uh, so it looks like on average here, my max load is five dynos. So run it at five. Okay, fine. And of course, this, this does take into account like the fact that it's running, it needs five dynos with whatever your config is at this particular moment, but it's just a starting point. Um, what you'll probably find with dyno load and what most, most of my clients find is that this number is a lot lower than the number of dynos that they actually use um, because uh, their app servers are, are not uh, configured correctly. So we'll get into how to fix that. So that's step one, estimating our worker count. So, we know how many processes we need. We need 45 processes to serve our, to serve our load. Uh, so how do we divide that among containers? Do I wanna use a 1x dyno, 2x dyno? Now you have perf dynos, perf m, perf l. Um, what's the right choice? Uh, so I find most people mess up with container sizes because they have a incorrect mental model of how Ruby uses, app, uh, uses memory. What most people think uh, application memory graphs should look like in Ruby is like this. So it should look like a flat line. Um, We've been duped! Duped! Bamboozled! We've been speckledorfed! That's not even a word and I agree with you. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, they look like logarithms. Uh, so a, a, a regular application, a, re a regular Ruby application, will look like, uh, their memory usage over time will, will look like this. It'll have a pretty steep uh, startup period. This is when uh, we're requiring code, building out caches like uh, active record statement cache, um, and a bunch of other things like that. We're creating these long-lived objects, and then after a while, it'll start to level out. Uh, but it never goes flat, and I don't want you to think that it ever will. Um, this is probably partly why Heroku restarts your dynos every 24 hours, uh, because if they just let them run forever, this line would just eventually go on forever. It doesn't mean you have a memory leak. Um, if memory usage isn't flat, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a leak. Um, but you just need, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but uh, you just need to be aware that that line never will 
completely level out, so you're gonna have to use a little bit less memory than, um, than the max of your dyno. You're not gonna be able to run it at 100, close, uh, you know, right next to 100%. You're gonna have to give it some more headroom. Um, a common mistake I see here is to use things like Puma Worker Killer and then give it a, um, a, a RAM, an RSS, a RAM number and say, kill my Rails process when it's more than 300 megabytes. And if you set that number too low, your memory graph, instead of looking like that long red line, it looks like this. It looks like this purple stuff. And you'll see that sort of like, it goes up to here, it kills itself, it goes back down, kills itself. And people see that memory graph then, and they think, wow, look at that, it's that, that sawtooth pattern. I must have a memory leak. But really what's happening is they're not letting their processes live long enough to get to that stable point. Um, people sometimes use Puma Worker Killer as like a, uh, a faster restart, so you can also give Puma Worker Killer like a six hour limit and say restart my process every six hours. Um, that can also produce this kind of, um, uh, this memory graph as well. So what I'm telling you is let your process run for 24 hours, and if you have to tune the number of processes per dyno down to do that, do it. And this can, just as a temporary thing, you know, tr to, uh, tune web concurrency down to one, let that process run out and see what it looks like after 24 hours. And you're gonna have to you know, run more dynos, uh, but see what it looks like after 24 hours. If it does this, if it eventually starts to level out, um, that's the real number of how much memory you need per process. So deploy with one X or two X dynos, one worker per dyno, five threads per worker, and look at the average memory usage after 24 hours. Uh, the average app will come out to about 256 megabytes all the way up to 512. Um, so if that's the number you're getting, you know, that's average. Uh, 512 is not great, um, but uh, that's kind of what happens with big, old, mature Rails apps. Um, they use a lot of memory and uh, that's what you get. Um, there's really no magical way to reduce that number. I have another, if you go back, um, I have a Ruby, RubyConf talk that I gave, uh, RubyConf this year, about reducing memory usage, um, but there's no magical way to do this. It's a long and hard process. Okay, um, so that's step two. We determined uh, how much memory we use per process, per worker. Uh, so now, how do we decide what size container to put it into? Oh, it's so cozy. Oh, my bike. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we want our processes to feel like. They should feel nice and comfy in their dyno. Should, you should be sitting at 80% memory usage in that, in that dyno. It should be just, just right, not, not hitting 100% and starting to swap, but just sitting at, you know, four-fifths, two-thirds memory usage is the total capacity of your dyno. Uh, so these are the, the, um, the main dyno types that you're gonna use in production. I didn't include like hobby and free for obvious reasons. Uh, so the, diff the main difference is that most people, Rails applications are gonna care about is the memory, right? So um, you can read the numbers here. I'm not gonna read them out to you. Um, because Heroku dynos are you know, shared, uh, like kind of like a VPS, um, although a 1X and 2x dyno technically have the same count of CPUs, um, the 2x dyno gets two times the amount of time, the amount of CPU time, um, and so on and so forth with perf M and perf L. So to, uh, to the perf M dyno should have, you know, 12x, well, I guess one, two, three x the perf CPU capacity of a 1x dyno. Um, Although, from, from what I understand, from what Terrence told me, so blame him if this is wrong, uh, it's kind of interesting here. Uh, 2X dynos and 1X dynos have access to eight hardware threads. Uh, the Perf M dyno only has access to two. Um, so that's kind of like an interesting, weird difference between Perf M and all the other dynos. Although Perf M does have more share uh, of that uh, time than, than 2x, and the whole reason perf dynos exist uh, is because you do not share 
um, uh, CPU time with other uh, people's Heroku apps. So you should get more stable performance from a perf dyno uh, because you don't have someone else's, you know, badly tuned uh, Rails application sitting alongside it on, on this, um, on whatever server is actually backing it and crowding you out of the, of the CPU time. Um, another interesting thing that I noticed when comparing uh, perf dynos to the 1X and 2X is that the perf M dyno, it does cost $250 a month, uh, which makes it a little bit less cost effective than the other dyno types. Um, perf L dynos um, are just as cost effective in terms of like dollar per compute unit and dollar per RAM uh, gigabyte as the 1X and 2X dynos, but perf M you take a little bit of a hit. Um, and I already talked about 2X dynos have eight CPUs. Um, that m which might mean they can support higher thread counts than, than um, uh, like a perf M dyno. We'll get to how to set thread counts in a second. So if you have more than 25 app instances, if based on Little's law, you need more than 25 processes, um, I would recommend using perf L. Uh, the performance dynos do get more stable, consistent performance um, than 1X and 2X because they don't share the, the server with anybody else. Um, otherwise, try to use 2x. Um, the reason you don't want to use 1x is because you should be aiming to have at least three workers, three processes per dyno. Um, if you can't fit three workers inside of a 2x dyno, you might have to use perf L, or sorry, perf M. Um, the reason that you need three workers per dyno uh, is because of the way Heroku does routing. So uh, requests can be routed to any random dyno in your application. Um, or sorry, any random dyno in your, you know, formation, I guess. Um, if you only have one worker per dyno, uh, if, if Heroku randomly routes a request to that dyno uh, and in that worker is already working on someone else's request, it's going to sit there and it's going to wait until that, that request is done. Um, this kind of goes back to an old queuing theory thing where uh, instead of having uh, at a grocery store, instead of having multiple checkout lines, you know, you're like at Walmart or whatever, you have 10 checkout lines. It's more efficient to have one line and then multiple people at the checkout, like the way Whole Foods does it, if you've ever been to Whole Foods. Um, so the more workers we have for Dyno, the more efficient routing we can get out of, um, out of Heroku. So generally I've found that if you have at least three workers per Dyno, you're maximizing your, your routing performance. Um, I just said that. Um, if you're struggling to fit three workers in a 2X dyno, um, you can try reducing thread count. If you have Puma or Passenger Enterprise, if you have a multi-threaded application server, reducing the thread count to three, um, if you're running high thread counts, can help. Um, or you can use JE malloc. Um, Sam Saffron of Discourse has been sort of the pioneer in using JE malloc for production Ruby applications. You can Google him and read about it, uh, read about how to do it yourself. It can sometimes reduce memory usage by five, 10 percent, and give you that extra little bit of headroom to squeeze into a 2x dyno. There's a, a J malloc build pack, which I help to maintain, so you can do this on Heroku. If you search J malloc build pack Heroku, you'll find it and learn, and, uh, and, uh, learn how to use it. Um, so if you have a bit of knowledge on, um, you know, application server management, uh, you might think that the maximum number of processes you should run per dyno would, should be equal to the core count. You shouldn't run nine processes if you only have eight cores, uh, because in theory, we can only uh, run eight processes at one time on an eight core machine. Uh, what I found in production is that is not really the case. Um, it can, applications could really benefit by having uh, worker counts that are three to four X uh, the amount of cores available. So on a perf L dyno, um, I've, I know Product Hunt, um, is a Rails application, Product Hunt um, runs 30 to 40 workers on a perf L dyno, which is 4x the amount of cores available. And they also run some like node processes in the same dyno. Uh, so there's tons of stuff being competing for this CPU time. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just a, a lot of waiting on IO, um, but uh, don't restrict yourself if you've ever heard that advice before to uh, processes must equal core counts. Uh, it can be three to four X that number. Keep thread counts to three to five. This is now, the way we set this now is Rails max threads, right? Um, more, 
more threads per process than five tends to just fragment memory too much. Um, it's also really difficult with high thread counts to keep yourself under the connection limit. So uh, for Rails to connect to your Postgres database, for example, um, each thread needs its own connection to the database. So in general, we keep uh, the amount of threads we have per process equal to the size of the database pool. Uh, Rails does this by default. Um, if you have like 20 threads per worker uh, and now your, your connection limit for your database is only 100, uh, it's really easy to outstrip that connection limit really quickly. Um, so I found that thread counts of three to five offer a really good uh, compromise between processing requests concurrently, keeping connection limits with, out of reach, um, and avoiding memory fragmentation. Uh, how do you know if my, app is thread, if my app is thread safe? I get this question all the time um, because people don't, you know, are afraid of Puma or afraid of um, making their app multi-threaded. Um, so what Evan, Evan the um, maintainer of Puma, recommends people do is just to start slow, is to try two threads. If things starts breaking, you can just, you know, change that config var back and pretend it never happened. Uh, if you use mini-test, you can try mini-test hell, uh, which you just require mini-test hell at the top of your test helper, um, and it will run each test in a new thread. So if that doesn't break things, you're a god. Uh, and the, at the end of the day, if you're running MRI, it's probably fine. Um, I don't see many people running into actually like weird multi-threaded bugs, and if they do, they kind of, they know it's their fault. Um, they're like, oh yeah, I probably shouldn't have used the Redis global to like, you know, uh, to, in this controller. Um, or class level state, like user.current or class variables. Generally they find it, they're like, oh yeah, that's like really obvious, I should have realized that. And, and the other thing I hear is like, oh, but I don't know if my libraries are thread safe, and like same thing, I know as a library author, I really pay attention to thread safety and make sure, I go through our code, you know, to make sure that it's thread safe. Um, because in MRI, um, Ruby code must be, anytime you execute Ruby code that happens with the, the, the GVL, the GIL around it, it's actually kind of difficult to, to run into a threading bug. Uh, does it, it's not to say it doesn't happen, and it is annoying, um, but uh, don't be so afraid of it that you don't even try it. Okay, we've got our container size, we've got our um, worker count now. So let's make sure that we're not going to run over our connection limits. Uh, things that use connections, um, active record, active record's DB pool. Uh, you probably have connections between your um, Dynos and Redis, maybe memcache. Um, I think most of the memcache add-on providers for Heroku, uh, excuse me, don't limit connections. Like I don't, don't think memcache EA, uh, I think it has unlimited connections. Redis to Go used to like really heavily limit them, but some of the newer Redis providers don't um, really limit them so much. Postgres is really the, or, you know, your database is really the, the main connection pool that needs to be watched uh, because those limits are very easy to hit. Uh, you change that in database.yaml. Um, you need one connection per thread. It, that's the uh, default, I think, in the, in the database.yaml that gets generated. Um, and I already talked about Redis and, and Memcache. Um, you may need more than one database, database connection per thread. Um, if you use things like rack timeout, which most people do on Heroku because there's a 30 second limit, um, what can happen is uh, rack timeout can raise while we're waiting on a Postgres uh, query to return. And it, when it raises, that connection can get lost. Um, so. Uh, you may need to have up to double the amount of database connections per process than you have threads if, if, if that's a problem for you. Uh, you'll know that's a problem if you're, if you're getting errors that say like uh, active record is spent too long waiting for a connection or doesn't have one available. Uh, these are the Heroku Postgres plans and how many connections they support. Um, and after standard four, the larger sizes, it's all still limited to 500 connections. Do you need more than 500 connections? For an example on Heroku Postgres, uh, Heroku provides, I think it's a build pack, right? So the PG Bouncer build pack, uh, which you can add to your app, which will 
pool these connections for you, um, and you, you'll be able to share a smaller amount of connections uh, per process um, than you actually have threads. Uh, so just do the math to figure out how many dynos um, would outscale your connection limits. Uh, so as an example, if I have a perf L dyno with 20 app workers, and each of those app workers has a uh, five threads, that's 100 threads and 100 DB connections. So if I have five dynos, that's 500 connections, and I've hit my you know uh, standard for Heroku Postgres connection limit. So now we've checked our connection limits. We know how many, the maximum number of dynos that we can scale to before we hit our connection limits. And we, we're ready to deploy. Uh, so here are some things to watch after deployment. Um, watch memory. Uh, this is a pretty typical pattern that I see is uh, memory usage is fine and then blows out um, when someone hits a, like the CSV export controller. Uh, looks like that, yeah, looks really, so that's swap, that's really bad. That, that dark purple swap, you don't want to see that. That means you're using too much memory and you need to back off the number of processes per dyno. Now, when you have, uh, this is not a memory leak, it is a fat action. Um, the, the only way you can really track it down, if, if you're not, if, if you're seeing a curve like this where it's flat and then something, some action that someone used, you know, blew it out to double that number, um, there's, you, you gotta install an APM that does memory profiling. So New Relic does not do this very well. For as much as I love New Relic for everything else, um, Skylight, Scout are both commercial services that have memory profilers in production and they can tell you, hey, this controller action allocates 18 million objects. And you can say, that's really bad, I'll fix it. Uh, an open source alternative is Oink. And Oink basically writes to your logs um, and says, this action did X, Y, Z memory things, and then uh, Oink has like a log parser um, that will give you some statistics about um, what controllers allocate how much. So if you're running out of memory, scale down web concurrency. That's the way Heroku has this all set up by default. Uh, if, it's, if you're not using you know, 75% of, uh, of the amount of available RAM, uh, you can scale up web concurrency. Uh, you can also tweak thread counts, so fewer threads will use less memory. Um, you may think that because all a thread, because threads technically share memory, right, so all you need to uh, create an additional thread is just eight megabytes of stack, uh, but the way that malloc works, um, and this was something that changed in the C year 14 stack, uh, is it allocates what's called arenas to each thread when they <laughs> conflict, and at the end of the day, all it really means is uh, glibc malloc um, can have really bad memory fragmentation for a high thread count uh, or very highly multi-threaded programs. Um, you can control that with the malloc arena max environment variable. I can't get too much into detail about this because I'm running out of time, but if you just Google this, like malloc arena max Heroku, Terrence wrote a really good explanation of what it is, how to tune it. Um, this is really only relevant for like people that are running high thread counts or maybe your sidekick processes, which runs 25 threads or whatever, um, or Jay Malik, which I, I talked about earlier, tends to do um, a good job of this. Uh, this is a customer example, a client example of uh, tuning Malik Arena Max on a sidekick process. So they had a sidekick process that would balloon from uh, 256 megabytes to a gig over 24 hours, that's really bad. Uh, and then right here, he changed Malik Arena Max to two and it almost completely stabilized um, his memory usage. Uh, watch queue times. New Relic will tell you how much time, on average, a request spent queuing, so how, how much time it was not actually being processed. Um, less than 10 milliseconds is good. More than that is bad. Um, if you have high queue times, that just means you need more dynos. Uh, that's the time when you want to scale up. CPU usage, um, if your CPU usage is low, you may benefit from a higher thread count. Um, uh, restarts, so if you're using Puma Worker Killer, if you have to because you have a leak and you can't fix it, you need to be watching how often that dyno, how often those processes are restarting. What I find is some people install these killer, automatic killer tools, and then they, do not, they don't know how often it's restarting, and it's like restarting every other response, every request, that's really bad. Um, you're gonna 
uh, really hamper the performance of your application if your processes don't get to live very long. Um, at least six hours between restarts is a good goal. Um, and if you can't, you know, if, if Puma Worker Killer is, is, or whatever, you know, is killing your processes that quickly, you need to change those settings or use a bigger dyno. Um, so timeouts. Uh, so we all know Heroku has this like 30 second timeout where uh, if your application takes longer than 30 seconds to respond, it basically gives up on you and says, I will not return this response anymore. So we have things like rack timeout to, uh, to fix that. Um, if you have a lot of controller actions which tend to time out frequently and you don't have time to fix it, uh, a good Band-Aid is to change to a dyno formation where you're running more workers per dyno. So uh, as, as an example, I had a client that had um, some controller actions which took like 10 or 15 seconds to complete. Uh, it was like admin stuff. And uh, what would happen is a bunch of these requests would come in, like one after the other, um, and they would back up all the other requests behind them. So Dino would take 15 seconds to like do this admin action thing, and then like a bunch of requests would pile up behind it. So now all of those requests now take 15 seconds plus whatever time they would take normally. Uh, if you have problems like that where you have these 95th percentile times, which are really high, um, you're gonna benefit from having more workers per Dino. And that's because uh, while Heroku will route randomly to whichever dyno um, it wants, uh, your application server will not. They all work differently here. Passenger probably has the best model um, for this, but uh, even Puma uh, will do a better job of routing requests to open dynos which don't have any, uh, sorry, open processes which don't have any work to do. So it, with this uh, customer, they, had, they were running 2x dynos I put them on perfell dynos, and they almost completely got rid of their timeouts and uh, reduced their average response time by like 20%. Oh, uh, this is not big enough. Um, but you can uh, also, so you probably have rack timeout, uh, but Puma has a setting called worker timeout, and in passenger, it's passenger max request time. I don't know what it is in unicorn, but you can kill, the, you can actually just kill the process um, after a request has taken a certain amount of time. In Puma, we do this by default. Um, it's 60 seconds, uh, and passenger, it's, they, don't, they don't turn this on by default. You have to turn it on yourself. Um, in pass, if you are using passenger, I do suggest you turn this on because your requests probably don't need to take a minute, and if they are, you might as well just give up. So this is it. That's the process. Um, those are the steps. This is a slide you probably want to take a picture of. Um, I'm Nate Berkepec on Twitter. I'm going to tweet these slides out in, as soon as I'm off the stage here. Um, and my, the web, uh, website of my blog slash consultancy is speedshop.co. Thank you very much.